everybody. I'm Josh Wells, president of Film Independent, and welcome to a very special edition of Film Independent Presents, where we're going to be talking about the film uh, that I think many of you have already just seen, uh, Standing Up, Falling Down. And we are so fortunate today to have the director, Matt Ratner, um, along with the two leads of the film, Mr. Misters Ben Schwartz and Billy <laughs> Um uh, Before we get started, um, I just want to give a couple of thank yous. First of all, thanks to our lead sponsor of Film Independent Presents, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. We're so appreciative you make this program possible all year long, so thank you. Uh, thanks also to our screening partner, Vision Media, where we are able to share <coughs> films and co great content. And last but not least, thanks to our media partner, the Los Angeles Times. We love you guys. Um, so with that, um, Thank Josh, you. Can I thank two people real quick? Can I thank yeah. the, the jackets <laughs> in the background of Matt's uh, Zoom and the tiniest bookshelf I've ever seen? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Josh. We can keep going now. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for being here. And I, I just want to start by saying uh, I love this film. Um, and I, I have to say, this is, I don't know, this might be a strange comment, but because of COVID this year, the way films have come out, my awareness of, of movie, everything is off, right? In terms of what you've heard about films or the, the normal ways films get attention. And I feel like I did not see this film when it, it, earlier in the spring and I saw it more recently. And I just feel like this is such a beautiful film. I, I just wanna help spread the word and get people to see it because, because of COVID and the way things went with Tribeca and everything since, it's like we're, the way people learn about movies is very different and it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, unknown world that we're entering but congrats on this film um so but let's jump back to the beginning <laughs> ask how did uh how did this project come to you uh what attracted you to it and what was what was the very beginning of this i know that you started with a yeah. screenplay but been a long road um you know i've been looking for something to direct for a long time i've been producing but you know my background is in directing and, and that was really the the passion and there was a you know producer that I'd I'd worked with uh, on some previous films who sent me the script and I just you know it was the first script I'd read in a long time where I didn't want to wait until the next morning to you know call back I wanted to call right away um, I just thought you, you know even at these early stages it had this blend of humor and pathos that I really was was drawn to I thought it you know was real I thought it was you know at times side splittingly funny but also you know really about something and dealt with things that that everyone could relate to. Um, and, and was, you know, anchored by some really just, you know, beautifully drawn characters who I thought, you know, we could find some, some terrific actors to inhabit, of course, never imagining uh, in my wildest dreams that we find these particular actors, but, you know, it, it all, it, it starts with story, it always has and it always will. And then Peter Hoare, the screenwriter, just did a, a tremendous job with it. So could the three of you talk about how, I'd love to just hear how the cast came together, what was the order of things, and um, yeah, I mean, as for any filmmakers watching, you know how incredibly challenging it is to get talent attached to an independent feature. And I mean, this cast throughout, I mean, in addition to Ben and Billy, you have a, a fantastic cast with Mamie Goomer and so many great actors. Um, it feels like all, all of the characters are so fully fleshed out by the, the, the cast that you got. So talk about how that, how that came to be. Well, I, Yo, go, go should I jump in? All right, so uh, I got sent this, the, the script and <clears throat> I was very taken with it and thought, well, this could really be interesting. And then um, Matt came out and we spent some time talking and I had made some notes about what I thought could maybe help the character and help me uh, find my way into him. And um, we kept talking and talking uh, and I said, all right, what if I, if I did this, who's gonna play Scott? And he said, well, here's a, here's a reel. There's five actors on it. They're all really good. Um, see what you think. So I watched and they were all terrific, but Ben was the one that I knew a little bit about from Parks and Rec and, and um, House of Lies. And I had seen him play a very goofy offbeat rabbi in a, in a film called This Is Where I Leave You uh, with Tina Fey and Jason Bateman. And I thought, well, he's got, he's got charm. He's got skill. He also has a sadness about him that's very appealing. He has an honesty about him. And that's what this kid has. And, you know, it's very difficult to play a stand-up on, on screen. And it's, uh, it's uh, very difficult to play, maybe more difficult to play a so-so, maybe not good stand-up on screen. And so 
I said to Matt, let me, I'd like to talk to him. And so we arranged a phone call. He was in Atlanta making a movie and we hit it off on the phone and he came out. We spent like two, three hours together. We just fell into each other. And I, I called Matt and said, I'll do the movie only if you get Ben. And that's, that's, Ben can take it from there. I was, I mean, that's one of the most surreal sentences in the universe to get a phone call from, uh, I remember where I was when I was talking to Billy for the first time in my hotel room, pacing back and forth because you've heard his voice, you know, like for me, I've heard his voice since I've been a kid uh, in movies and then in comic relief. And then, you know, as a goddamn eyeball on a Pixar movie. <laughs> so it's like, and then I would just call him I, phony phone calls to his family. <laughs> yes. I didn't know them. Yeah, I was just call saying the phone for hours. Harassment, really. Uh, well, but well. it was uh, it was it was incredible. I got I got the script, and then uh, when they said Billy was doing it, it, it almost didn't matter what the script was. Uh, I would have done anything uh, he wanted. And then um, the the script was great. And then uh, I was a little bit. I remember I was a little bit anxious at the beginning to be like uh, to tell Billy my true thoughts on the script just in case. But I was like, hey, this is what I. I was like, this is really good. This writer is great. Peter Hoare is great. There's some things that I would tweak and he goes, so would I. And we had the same exact ideas in what we would want to have as a conversation with Peter. And that's when I was like, oh, it's not just me getting to work with Billy. It's like, we're going to collaborate and I'm going to be able to like learn and all, all these wonderful things. So it was, it was, inc I would have done it no matter what. And then the idea that everybody that's creative, Matt Ratner, Peter Hoare and Billy were all able to get together and, uh, you know, keep playing with this thing, which is something that doesn't often happen in indie movies, especially, you don't, you know, you don't have much time for anything. So it's like the idea that we had a couple days before to talk it through to rehearse. And it was, it was a joy of all joys. It was the, it, uh, such an easy thing to say yes to. And then such a unique and lovely experience for me because I've looked up to Billy my entire life. So to, to be able to act next to him and learn from him is gorgeous for me. Well, and I think it was really, I mean, those two things were really both incredibly fortuitous. One is, you know, you're not, this is not a studio film. We're not doing chemistry reads, right? It's, it's a two hour meeting and, and Billy and Ben's relationship, you know, off screen or on screen really, it, you know, were sort of mirror images of each other. It was definitely a case of, you know, life imitating art where they become you know, incredibly close in a very short period of time as do Scott and Marty. And then, you know, I think also to what Ben said, Peter, who's just incredibly gracious, Billy, Ben, uh, who were so generous of their time, and, and myself, we all saw the movie the same way. I think we all wanted to make the same film. Um, and there are very different versions of, of the movie you could probably make. There's, there's a broader, more comedic version. There's a version that sort of delves more into the, the pitfalls of, of substance abuse. Those are very valid movies, but, but they weren't the story we wanted to tell. And I think the fact that all four of us wanted to tell the same story really from, from the jump made the, the process you know, a fruitful and be fun. And what I loved about it was that it was always about the work. It was, um, there was no egos about anything. It was just, how do we make this as good as we can make it every day? And on a very short schedule, um, we shot the movie actually in two and a half days. We, <laughs> we, with a, with a small budget, it was with so a pinhole small. pinhole camera, one pinhole camera, two and a half days. <laughs> I didn't even have a, my character doesn't have a last name. That's how small the budget was. And, <laughs> but it was, it was just all about how can, how can we keep improving on this? How can we every day? And, um, you know, Matt um, was just so eager to listen and, but yet had control over what he wanted the movie to be. And we all saw it the same way. But yet he was so open to changes and how about this, how about that? And he just said, try it. It was always to try it. Um, and I think that was really wonderful about it. Uh, for Ben and I, um, you know, we changed in a car, we changed in a men's room at the, at the restaurant that we were shooting. And it, it, it didn't matter, it was so much fun to have these two characters that we both loved being inside that it was just so much, I don't know, it just, it really was a joyous experience coming every day with confidence that we were going to do good work that day. And some of the days we had, you know, seven, eight page scenes um, that we would have, yeah. And, and um, it was so, it was uh, for me, after all of these years of doing, you know, studio kind of movies, this was so exciting and refreshing that at this point there's still stuff to learn and still stuff to experience. And that, you know, you have, um, a crew and a, and a cast that all were working for the same thing. And that's a, that's a real great feeling. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Um, 
you know, as I said, I I, I found the whole cast so strong, and and mm. all the the other characters. It's 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 a great cast. But really, to me, that what I love most about the film is seeing the relationship between the two of you. I mean, I love films where there's this unexpected core relationship, like the fact that <clears throat> two of you meet and, and form this friendship is so, you know, unusual and unexpected. And then the way that it plays out in the film is just beautiful. And I, I mean, Matt, to your point that there could have been different different versions of this film, I, I was thinking about that because like what I love about the film is it combines like, there's like some seriously dark stuff here. There's right like failure and and lack of redemption and addiction and all this stuff but you play it with such lightness the darkness is there but the, the seeing the rapport between the two of you it's just this lovely you see a friendship blossoming in front of your eyes it's just so great I mean it just draws the audience in and I'd love to hear I mean from Ben and, and Billy like given in the independent film world you don't have time for rehearsal or spending a lot of time right you're just on set and you go how did you how did you guys find that? I mean, well, I think it started with the phone call when he was in Atlanta. And then we he came out and we met. And is there something about um, just knowing um, and just being intuitive with each other that he gets it? Mm -hmm. And and I I know it was mutual. So we spent a lot of time talking while Matt was in, in New York preparing before we even came to New York. Mm. And, and so we were really mentally ready, I, I believe, for the challenge of being these guys because we already were them. And, and so when we, we, we were in a tiny little studio, the first day of shooting, it was in Brooklyn, Matt? It was in Brooklyn? Yeah, yeah. About, I mean, but a really small studio mm -hmm. for the uh, office scene when they first uh, meet when I'm, you know, the dermatologist. And it just clicked. It just, it wasn't a first day. It felt, it, there was no first day in the movie. I just felt like we were always doing it. And that's a great thing, you know, to feel creatively as an actor that, um, you know, I can fly off, but there's a guy who's going to catch me. And I was there for Ben the same way. So we played a little bit and, and in, that, in that first day's work, and it was just joyous. We just left the set going, you know, all right, what do we do tomorrow? It was, it's great. Uh, so that was the prep was just being for me, who Ben and I are mm -hmm. and, and, and trusting in Matt to just um, get us there. There was two, the, that first day, which is uh, as people who make independent film know, the idea to get on a stage is unheard of. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And we had one day, is that correct, Matt? One day on stage? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's the joy of independent film. You, you, you need to shoot at least a day on a qualified soundstage in New York for the tax credit. So we, structured it so that the first shoot, and this is where the sort of producing side helps, we structured it so the first day was on a stage so it would be a controllable environment. And the first scene we shot was the scene of them in the bathroom meeting. Um, so it is, you know, if there is anything that sort of needs to get figured out, it's, they don't know each other. They don't have a relationship then. We shot that scene and we shot the, the big scene in uh, the dermatology office, that was day one. Yeah, and the, the I remember, um, it's like, it, 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 Billy's right. I think the big thing, uh, is trust. And uh, I had it easy because I can look at Billy's work and know that, you know, I can trust his comedic instincts and stuff like that. But the, the one thing that, you know, you're unsure about for someone who's so established is this guy's done so many studio movies. He's done this is that I hope that he's down to play. I hope that he's down to, and he was so down to create and play. And, uh, and he, and he it felt like he trusted me. So we were able to take risks and kind of figure out where things go. And also because both of us are, uh, you know, have a little bit of writing in us as well. Before we did any of the scenes, we'd be with Matt and we rehearse the scene once to ourselves and tweak anything. Or while we're getting changed, Billy and I would do it in, in the room or like while we're right before any moment that we had. Uh, you're looking at ev everybody here. And also the thing that I love that you guys uh, do, Josh, is you um, champion creative filmmakers. And all of us love making movies or television shows that like we love we love this stuff so much. And you could tell it because Billy's been doing this a long time and he was prepared, ready, every single day, ready, so ready. And he had some very meaty, very dramatic, some incredible scenes. And both of us just came 100% prepared, memorized, but also able to roll with each other anytime we can. And I think that that trust was there. And I think it, it made those first days go, but it's the same thing. Like if I play a big venue and I'm doing an improv show, um, I will, 
be a little bit nervous until I get my first laugh. And then I'll be like, all right, we're, let's have fun. And so for me, that first day was kind of like that with Billy. All right, what's this going to be like? And he's exactly right. I remember when we were doing that dermatology scene when I was in his office and it was just flying. It was just moving. It felt, it felt like we were just two human beings that a camera happened to be on us. I know how cheesy that sounds, but it's like, oh, this is what it's going to feel like. It's going to feel like we're just going to try to make this as real and lovely and we could take risks with each other. And that's that first day and you could feel it. And Matt is the director and Peter is the writer. And uh, to be opposite Billy, you just kind of have that feeling like, okay, we're going to be okay. Let's, let's see, let's see uh, if we yeah. keep being prepared and we keep taking risks and keep trying to find how to make every moment the best that we can make with the limited time that we have. So that's and, and to both of their credit, I think the one concern, you know, I had going in was, you know, these are two incredibly funny guys who, you know, will text each other and make each other, you know, crack up all the time. And it's, you know, will it stay grounded in truth? Will it stay grounded in the work? And every choice they made, anytime we tried something different, it was never about getting a laugh. It was always mm. grounded in, you know, is this what Marty, is this true to Marty? Is this true to Scott? Is this true to the story we're telling? And so as a director, then that's immensely freeing because you know that, you know, everything you're, you're getting is stuff that will fit within the fabric of the film. Well, and Matt, I mean, to, Piggyback on that, I think to your credit and also to the script, the, the, those moments of, of dark, you don't shy, the, the film has a lightness, but you don't shy away from like the, the dark elements and like the, towards the end of the film, the son yeah. saying, no, he was not a great man and, and no, I'm not gonna give him forgiveness. He doesn't get a second chance. Like you just let that stand, right? The, it's not tied up in a, in a sweet bow at that moment, which I think is great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's not a, you know, life isn't tidy, right? Um, and I don't, and I didn't want to make a tidy film. You know, I think there's something powerful about the fact that there's a redemptive arc that's not completed. Um, and, you know, that, it, and it was one of, you know, it's important to see that sort of other side of Marty. Um, it's one of, it was one of Billy's, um, you know, best script notes was, it's a tiny little moment, but um, the two things that were added, one was Ben getting Marty to put down the drink in the house. So you start to believe that maybe this redemptive arc is actually gonna, maybe you think it really could be different this time. And then really, you know, the way we ended up cutting the scene of uh, when Marty doesn't show up at karaoke, um, we felt like it was really important, even in a small way for, for Marty to fail Scott, for there to be that other side of the, of the coin there. Um, and yeah, that was something that was incredibly important with, with the actors we, you know, we were you know, looking at was understanding that this, this, this is not a movie that ends with Marty playing catch with his grandson. Right, right. Nate Corgi was the son and he was unbelievable. Nate was the third. Yeah, yeah. That Sorry, scene go ahead, ben. Him and, No, please. That scene between him and Billy where they're on, uh, if people have just seen the film, that scene between him and Billy where they're outside the house, uh, such a beautiful scene by both actors. It was so beautiful. And it's a testament to the people that Matt hired because there's an actress named Eloise Mumford who had to do these insane insane talking scenes and her first day we're in a mall and you know what I mean and then Nate Cordry he has to come right off the bat with an incredibly emotional scene without having the days and days of work that both Billy and I put in beforehand to get comfortable and so man the the, the casting of this uh, uh, movie was fantastic sorry Matt about that no, no that's the yeah. thing about Nate is um, I think he's only in three moments in the movie he's in the in the church at the funeral then he's mm. He's got the big scene with me outside his house, and then he's at the funeral. Oh yeah, saying goodbye. Um, but but his impact, um, I mean, there's a delicacy to the writing. There's uh, you know there's so you don't have to overwrite this relationship. Right. Um, you get it from the time they first look at each other, and then Marty goes on a bender uh, with Scott, and then one of my favorite moments in the film. Uh, is the phone calls that he tries to make as he's getting drunker and drunker. And you, we toyed with having, we're shooting Nate on the other, uh, on, at home, listening to the phone calls and not answering it. But I think you get it um, that he just is not there for him. And um, it just kept the focus perhaps where it should be. But, uh, you know, he was a, he's a very powerful actor. And that scene was my last day of shooting. Uh, and it, it, you know, it was a perfect ending because that's how Marty ends in the movie. Um, and so for, you know, creatively, we, we started together um, where we met in the bar, then uh, my office, and then everything else felt chronologically sound for me. So it, um, it was a very good through line, uh, scheduling wise, 
So I always knew where I was and, and Ben and I always knew where we were in our relationship. And as a funny side note, Peter Hoare um, lived in my hometown when he wrote the script uh, of Long Beach, New York. And just now that people have seen the movie, the funeral scene is in the temple that I was bar mitzvahed in. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <That's> amazing. <laughs> yeah. And we did not know that when we were scouting. You know, we, got, we figured it out later, but. Yeah. I lived right around the block. I lived right around the block. Um, yeah. Wow. Friday night services would end at 9.50. I'd run around the corner, get home on time to watch Rod Sterling do the intro to the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Ben, I, I had a question for you. <clears throat> you know, the, your character, right at the top of the movie, he's, he's, he has failed. He has, his dream of going to LA and making it did not work out. He's going home. And, you know, he has this sister who mercilessly makes fun of him for being a failure. I'm just curious how you approach that as an, I mean, obviously it's acting, but you're at a point in your career where you're, you're thriving, you're, right, you're, you are not this guy, you are, but how did you approach that sort of, what did you draw on to create that? Because I feel like you create that sense of failure and the sadness that comes with that. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm not, uh, so, oh. I, I wish I was a, uh more articulate uh, I, the, I feel like when I do roles uh, oftentimes I find uh, I find them to try to be an exaggeration of myself it's never me but it's like I can find this moment in my life find that find that emotion and kind of build that out to be this is a big thing so um, I am uh, terrified of failure even now and I think I don't think it really goes away from the people who I've talked to that have had uh, careers it's like Okay, um, which by the way, is something I probably should get better at. I'm not great at enjoying the moment of things when I'm, um, I'm getting better at it. When we were doing this movie and I was acting opposite Billy, I was able to take a moment and be like, this is fucking crazy. Sorry for Christmas, this is crazy. <laughs> and so like, this is amazing. I'm really, so I'm trying to get better at it. But oftentimes, and I think people who've been hustling a long time uh, and I, I'm a, a writer and an actor. So, you know, like, you know, sometimes I won't be getting scripts sold or whatever. But it's always like, okay, this is happening. I have 10 more days of this shoot. What am I going to do next? What am I going to do next month? Do I have to write another movie or do I have to try? You know what I mean? So, but at the very beginning, um, terrified by failure. Because first of all, it's a huge risk being like, all right, I'm going to try to be a comedian or an actor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then, especially at UCB, it's like you're taking classes and uh, you don't know if you're going to be on uh, Upright Citizens Brigade where I started doing improv. You don't know if you're going to be put on a team. And if you don't get put on a team, then what happens? Oh my God, what am I going to do with my life? And so I found that because, I mean, you're pushed by it so much, the idea of uh, failure. So I found that and you just, I, I exaggerated that version uh, for Scott because it's like, I know so many people that are so funny, but just didn't get lucky enough or they're so funny and they just couldn't figure out one aspect of their career to really push them to. Um, and so it's so easy to be very funny and people far more funny uh, than I am, but just didn't get their break. And so- it could happen, but I, I think also one of the things I tried to play, which Billy brought up was, I never wanted him to be great at standup. Uh, I know I do improv and standup is very different, but it's like at the beginning, um, even though we took a bunch of my tweets, that's a lot of those jokes are tweets of mine from like the past 10 years, but it's like, um, we wanted him to not be, not be killing, but also his jokes are just okay. And then when he starts <clears throat> to get better, we didn't want him to be like Chappelle where all of a sudden everybody's like, what? He's just a little bit better than he was before. Right. So right. like we, but, that was another right. thing, but you could see him starting to connect with the material through uh, sentences that Billy Crystal's character had said, which also mimic things that Billy in real life had said. Um, and also uh, just because I'm a nerd and have listened to interviews that Billy's done, seems like in, uh, advice that he had gotten when he was doing uh, Catch a Rising Star, right, Billy? The idea of connecting with who you are, the idea of when Billy was doing stand up and starting to break, he was, he was a young father, he was a young husband, and why not connect with that material? And so Billy uh, smartly put that as something that his character would say to my character, instead of doing these little bits, why don't you connect with what's happening to you? You're hanging out with your dream, all these things. So, um, uh, so that was it. So the, 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 he's right that at the beginning, I never wanted to be, I never wanted him to crush, because I think that's too much of a movie moment. I want him to just be a little bit better than he was before. But the idea of failure, I think, follows even the most successful people um, you can feel your, your confidence, not narcissism, but your confidence can grow being like, all right, I've done like, I've done 12 independent movies. So I was like, I, can, I know I can get through, you know, these 18 day shoots where you're doing 10 days, uh, 10 pages a day. 
I've done it before. So your confidence in that grows, but what's going to be next? What happens if nothing happens next? What happens if uh, it's easy to find that insecurity and in, in, uh, find it in me and push that to be the character's drive and um, his, just feeling absolutely lost. What a terribly long answer to a, a small question. <laughs> um, so I have a, a two-part question um, basically relating to COVID. So for the first part, for, Matt, I'd love to hear you talk just how you've been navigating this, right? This was not the release or the life anyone would have predicted. I mean, like you got into Tribeca for this year, which was great, but then it was a, a, essentially a virtual festival. And I'm just curious to hear any thoughts you have as a, as a producer and director, how you've been navigating this moment. And then part yeah. two of the question is for Billy and Ben, which is just, I would love to hear, I don't know, any thoughts you have on how this moment you think is impacting comedy and what we find funny and how you connect with an audience and all of it, just like, I, I feel like as performers, your lives are upended by this. So, but let's go back, Matt, Matt if you wanna take the first part on. You know, I mean, I, I, we really got very lucky with just how our, and you know, our release sort of synced out and, and that we were able to, to have our moment together and able to enjoy a premiere and, and able to enjoy all those things. Um, and you know, it's, of course, this is an industry that's uh, rapidly reinventing itself constantly. And, and COVID has certainly been a, a huge curve, curveball and, how you, as you know, storytellers, you, you want yeah. people to see your stories, right? Um, and and so how you how you get films out and how you know, as somebody who comes from the theater, I, I absolutely believe in the the power of a, a sort of communal experience. And that said, even before COVID, you know, that was just not where the business was trending. Um, and, and you have to be aware of that because you know you're in the job of getting movies made, and movies don't make their uh, investors hold, and you don't get to make more movies. So there's a there's a reality to that. Um, I think that. Uh, part of what was um, has been really interesting is is this was not a movie obviously that was shot during COVID. It's not a COVID movie in any way. But so many people, as we've been doing these sort of virtual film festivals, you know, uh, in in the last six months, have said to us some version of, well, you know, this really it really resonates with them. First of all, I think because of Scott having to go home and live with his parents, that's something a lot of people are experiencing right now. Um, and also just I think it's it, it, it's been such a sort of dark time. I think you know while you know you said and you're right we don't shy away from the darker moments but hopefully this is a movie that you see and then you leave you, you really sort of feel good about it you feel you know you take something out of it you feel inspired to maybe think differently and and for a movie that deals so much with regret I think COVID is has for all of us really made people refocus on on the relationships that are important um and that's mm -hmm. you know we I'd never heard of COVID when we shot the film but I think there is some sort of you know unexpected resonance there and if it can you know give people an hour and a half respite from the reality of what's going on, then, then so much the better. That's great. Um, ben and Billy, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have on, I mean, Ben, you mentioned UCB and I know like that world, the improv world, which is so vital to discovering new talent and, you know, just the experience of that. That's like not possible now, right? So it's a very, uh, three out of the four theaters have closed for UCB. So there's only one left. Um, and uh, so I perform in a place called Largo now, uh, me and a middle edition Schwartz, which is, um, we have these specials on Netflix. It's a two person improv group and we were on tour. We were in Detroit when we were, when we came home and then canceled all of our shows. So we were touring um, for people who tour and make their money that way. It is a very weird and unique time. Um, and also it's, this is uh, by far the longest since I started doing comedy in 2002. It's by far the longest I've ever been between shows. I mean, it, the, the old one was two months or something like that. Now this is not nine months or however long we've been, you know. So it's, it's a very weird, it's a very, in terms of live performing, it's very weird and you want to get out there and you want to make people laugh. And I'm not quite certain also how normal it'll feel when we start doing shows again when it's safe because i'm sure there's going to be there's going to be different versions of what those are like is it half the audience is it everybody has to get a, a rapid test right before they come in is it people are going to be nervous when someone coughs you know i mean there's going to be a lot of yeah. things to navigate i really want to make people laugh again as much as like that's something i really miss being in a room and making people laugh but i'm not certain what it is it's also very weird for like uh, like uh, Sonic and this and um, Space Force, all these things kind of came out during uh, COVID. 
Right. It's been a very interesting thing for things to happen and not to be around human beings when they happen. Um, it's a very unique thing. And uh, Billy could probably speak on it more than I have because he's done so many films that have uh, come out. But it's a weird thing. Not to, Usually you go out and you kind of get a sense of what people think. Um, right. And you don't really, you know, because human beings will kind of tell you what they think. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit interesting to navigate like, Oh, I hope people like this movie or I hope, you know what I mean? Um, but the live stuff, I'm, I'm anxious to get back, but nervous. I, I have no idea what it's going to look like. Mm. Um, but Billy, what are your thoughts on it all? Well, it, it's obviously, you know, just thrown us out of our orbit. Um, I had, uh, when it first hit, I was, had just gotten to a point where I was um, finalizing a cut on a movie that I, that I directed with Tiffany Haddish. And um, I had to complete my post like this. So I did music scoring with a session in a studio in New York and I'm here in LA and I color correction and everything edited, everything was done. Thank God it could be finished um, that way. But again, the people, you miss the people, you miss the, the, the what I was, uh, what I love to do um, you know, when finishing a movie like that and being in the, in the control room and being able to reach over and to make that a little louder. Can you bring the horns? Up? And you have to do it like, like this. Um, is, we did it and, it and I'm very proud of it, but it, it robs you of, the, of your life. It robs you of your, mm. the, the, the spontaneity and, and it's, it's all about the people. And um, you know, we, we, on that movie, we only had one screening, um, uh, two actually, um, but you know, you needed four or five to, to get a real feel of what, so in that, you know, I've had some of the best experiences of my life uh, in dark rooms with strangers and that's watching movies. And, and when, you know, I, when, you know, she gets eaten in, in Jaws, the screams when her head spins around and the exorcist screams. Um, psycho, my God. And, and uh, when I was still in high school, the terror, you know, and I remember being at the Afco embassy on West, in Westwood watching Alien. And when that thing came up out of his stomach and ran across uh, the room, uh, the, 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 the this theater was shaking for like a minute afterwards. So you, it's this, this incredible experience you have with people you don't know is is right now gone, and so that's a drag. Being funny, you know, is um, uh, I've done several Kimmel shows, uh, who I love doing, but you know, he's got he's got twenty people in the background. At, at least there's something, you know, to be funny. But this timing is off, and everything's a, a beat later, and there's you know. Uh, Listen, I'm 72. I think I've broken the record for people saying, unmute, unmute. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it, you know, I, I, uh, I'm scheduled to have been scheduled to do a Broadway show that would have been running now. Um, and now we push, pushed it another year mm. um, until um, people will, you know, feel safe to come into a Broadway theater. Mm. Um, I don't even know if that'll happen. Um, right. So it's just, we're doing the best we can. It's a, it's a pleasure to be able to do this. Yep. And, and that your audience will see this, this little gem of a movie. Um, and, you know, that's the thing also, I, and I shouldn't have even said little, because we talk about, it's a little movie. There are no little movies. This, this film is a powerhouse <clears throat> and, it, and it grips people and, and, and people feel and people laugh and people get emotional in all the right ways. So I know for all of us who are, um, you know, associated with it on whatever level, we made something really good. And, and I'm grateful that you've taken the time to, 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 for your audience to see it as well. You know, I was thinking, um, Going back to the depression, like in the twenties and thirties, that was such a great period for film. Oh, and I thought you, I thought you meant last week. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
you know, in the, in the, in the depression, you had other, the great screwball comedies in the 20s and 30s, mainly I guess, the 30s and, and musicals. And there was a sense of, I don't know, the sense of comedy and, and humor at that period in response to the depression. I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on like, like the types of material that you're looking to do now, or do, do you see like, a, is there an opportunity for a different type of comedy coming out of this? Or that you think will really audiences will respond to in a different way? Hmm. Hmm. I hope so. I mean, that's that's what my new one is is um, is a, a dramedy more, you know, and it's very funny, but but um, rooted in a real emotional uh, uh, crisis for the two characters. And I just, you know, I think if you like this, like standing up, falling down. If you make it with with the right amount of integrity, and you just tell the truth. And you don't have to use a big brush. Um, that's then you're making something that I think, on whatever level, it w works for people, um, because it's 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 honest. And I think that's what, you know, th there's a very little bit of music in this movie. Um, it's just appropriate, and it's just it just carries the the drama, and and embraces the humor without underscoring it and hammering at it and it, we just let the audience feel and and they feel what the actors are feeling and what would what would what would you know the story that we're telling so i you know in that way it's it's uh it's encouraging that when people see this movie um like in your lovely introduction to it you didn't get to see it now that you have it's like there's a wow about it yeah there's a, there's a great feeling of of um, integrity about standing up, falling down, that I'm really proud of. In terms of uh, the COVID stuff, um, <clears throat> I owe some scripts right now, and it's a conversation that I had where it's like, for me personally, and again, this is going to be different for everybody, but for me, it's like I don't want to write about COVID right now. I don't in my scripts. I don't want right. to. I don't want to. I want to give you a place to escape it. Um, but that's just me because I'm kind of like I don't want to think of. I, I, you know, it's all we've thought about for so long. Um, and I'm filming something now. I'm filming something called uh, The After Party, which is uh, Lord and Miller and Chris Miller's directing it. And we've done 40 days already, and we test eight times a week. Wow. And uh, we are so grateful to be working. There's a sense on set. Uh, first of all, we get to be funny. It's a comedy, and it's all funny people. But it's like you really feel a, like, oh, my God, we are so lucky to be doing this. And you feel that because there's that many reasons, but because there's that big break and because you, you know, because of all this, and we are also lucky, you know, we seem to be healthy on this zoom right now and stuff like that, but it's like uh, taking a break and seeing what happens without your work and the things you love to do, and then getting the opportunity to do it again when it's safe. And so uh, there's that feeling of, um, of that, I think so in terms of COVID stuff, mm -hmm. but I think, I think there used to be, this is a conversation I had before COVID. And, and Billy was in the run of these also. There used to be 15 to $25 million comedies. Right. And it doesn't exist anymore. And right. it's, it's so, uh, there's like maybe three a year, like one Melissa McCarthy, one Kevin Hart. You know what I mean? And they don't really exist yeah. anymore. And I grew up with Billy doing those. And I grew up with Steve Martin doing those. And I always wondered why they disappeared. Um, uh, uh, because for me, it was my lifeblood. Those that stuff, the early Jim Carrey stuff. Even when you go beyond Steve and Billy, so it's like, I always, I, I didn't, I haven't had the very intelligent conversation with someone yet, and why they've disappeared and why it has been so difficult to get that type of uh, movie made anymore. But that's the joy of independent cinema, and uh, yeah. why I love that you guys champion it and stuff like that. And um, I also think, like for someone like me coming up. I can only get my, I can only get my run in, in basketball, you get, you know, on the court, I can only really like get those meteor fun roles when people would give me a shot in an independent movie because monetarily it was a risk that they could take. Do you know what I mean? Because the budgets are so low. Yeah. So I am forever grateful for independent movies and why I continue always doing them. I find it to be such a joyful thing. And, um, and what you guys do and how you, how you champion them has always been uh, something. That's how I find out any indie that I missed. I look at your, award show and see that stuff. Oh, that's great. Well, Billy, I, going back to you, when your, your comment that there are no, it, it, like not a little movie, I think that's so true. And a good, I mean, I miss them. I miss going to the movie theater so much, but I want to say like the, the upside of this moment is 
like the last three movies I, I watched, I watched this film. I watched uh, the George Clooney movie, Midnight Sky, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I watched Tenant, the Christopher Nolan thing, which is now online. And like, there's a leveling thing. I'm watching them all on the same. I have a nice TV. It's, you know, it's big, but it's, it's got good sound, but it's a home thing. And I'm, so all the movies I'm seeing in the same way. And your movie is, it's not a little movie. It has an, right? It's got this powerful, it's funny, it's emotional, it's moving, it's smart. Um, and it's like the level, the playing field has been leveled in a weird way where it's, where I think it's positive, you know? And hopefully movies like this can reach a bigger audience through this m moment that we're in. Then maybe well, I think ho we ho hopefully it starts to erase that stigma. I mean, you know, Ben and yeah. Billy both talked about it, but this notion of, you know, somehow independent film or, or quote, smaller films, you know, it's not less than, it's different. Um, we're yeah. trying to do different things. We're, and, and I think that, you know, it create, does create a platform for more people to experience this content, um, especially as people are uh, running out of streaming. But it's also, you know, I, I do think there's something, you know, to your, to your question about COVID and the, and the depression, great art comes out of hard moments, right? You know, look back, even I'm thinking life is beautiful, um, you know, and you, you think about how as a, as a people and as a society, you know, how, you know, and, and certainly, you know, Billy and Ben are, are both wired this way as well. How do we respond to the stressful moments is we, you know, we diffuse with humor. Um, and that's been true since you know, people were drawn on caves. Um, and I think, you know, I, I can't speak for anyone other than myself, but certainly the content I've been drawn to, we, I got really lucky. We, I produced a film that wrapped maybe two weeks before COVID got really bad. So that'll wow. um, come out in the, uh, in, you know, the early, early part of the year. And, and we just feel so fortunate because literally had we been shooting two weeks later, we would have had half a movie. Um, and, and, you know, that's a similar tonal piece where it's trying to do, you know, um, it's funny, but it's also really about something. And then, you know, when I get scripts now that are you know, Zoom thrillers or, you know, dating in the time of COVID or it's just not, we're living it. I don't, I don't need to escape to it. Um, and, you know, I'm sure there will be lots of, of really sort of profound, intelligent pieces about what we've all gone through. Um, but I do, I do think, I, I can't remember something, certainly maybe 9-11, maybe where as a society, we all Americans and, and all went through something um, not just in the States, but globally, that had such a profound impact on everyone. Um, and I think it is going to, there's no question whether directly or indirectly, it will shape the narratives we're telling for a long time. You know, this, mm -hmm. is not, this is not gonna be a blip. This is something that is gonna sort of fundamentally change how we interact as, as humans. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Matt, Ben and Billy, I wanna thank you so much for taking time. We've, we've gone over here. I've just really enjoyed talking with you. I didn't, I, so I, I let this run longer than I should have, but uh, thank you so much. Congrats on the film. Um, it's lovely to talk with the three of you and uh, best of luck with, with the film. And, um, uh, you know, at Film Independent, we are, we're here to champion this kind of work and um, just really happy that you took time to, to talk to our, our folks and uh, about, about standing up, falling down.